Okay, right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming. My name's Arthur. I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Bookdash. I'm joined by uh, this co-founder here, Aiden. <laughs> In another room of our house is Michelle, Michelle Matthews. There she is. Uh, and um, in another room on the other side of the world in Amsterdam <laughs> is Taryn. There she is. Great stuff. Thanks. Um, and if this is your first uh, open publishing fest session, welcome to the, to the festival. We're in the second week of the open publishing fest. Uh, we've seen an amazing array of presentations and performances and demos and discussions. It's been really fun. So if you can, have a look through the rest of the calendar and join some other publishing fest events that are on today tomorrow and the next couple of days before it's all over but also many of the events are being recorded and so you'll be able to uh, see them afterwards as well but there's something about being here live that is extra special so we're extra excited that we're joined by people from all over on this call thanks so much for joining us um, for those who are joining us now, just mentioned that we are recording the call, uh, recording the, the discussion. So it will also be on our website later. So uh, what Michelle, Taryn, Aidan and myself are going to be uh, talking about is casting our minds back to when Book Dash all began. Uh, but I thought that just before we get that, get there, I suspect that most of the people who've joined us today already know quite a lot about Bookdash or something about what we are, but I don't want to assume that for everybody. And so I'll, I'll give a little high level nutshell, and then I want Taryn and Michelle also to weigh in, um, fill in my, my the, the blanks and to flesh out my description a little bit. And then we'll start casting our minds back to kind of where it all began. Uh, several years ago. So today, Book Dash is a non-profit children's book publisher. Uh, it has a full-time team of three people who are here on the call with us. Julia Norrish, the executive director, uh, Dorit Lowe, director, and, and Zaid Solari, uh, who uh, runs the office and many other things. And uh, they really do the work of Book Dash. The joy for the founders is that we, uh, we are on the board um, and we get to be part of the amazing journey as volunteers ourselves now. Uh, and Bookdash produces children's books that anyone can distribute for free themselves. Everything goes on our website. And the way that these books are created is that volunteer creatives who are in their day jobs or in their or serious enthusiasts, illustrators, writers, and designers join us in these incredible Bookdash Day events where we create books together in 12 hours. And the quality of books that they produce is just extraordinary. And so we now have 140 beautiful African sto children's storybooks on our website that have been translated into dozens of languages, reused all over the world. And we've been part of uh, printing and distributing copy, 750,000 copies of books to children around South Africa and other organizations have done the same in other parts of the world. So that's uh, a very high level nutshell. Um, Michelle, Taryn, uh, what have I missed? What's really important about what Bookdash is today? Um, I think I'll just kind of uh, stress the point uh, that they're kind of African storybooks. They're, they're relevant um, characters that, uh, that South African and other African children can really relate to and resonate with, which we've learned is so important. Um, for establishing that connection with reading in your life is to, to see characters that that represent you and that, that you resonate with. Um, and then also just to talk about, um, I mean, you mentioned the 750,000 um, physical copies that we've distributed, but also millions and millions of digital copies because we're able to partner with other organizations to uh, share that content. So it has incredible reach. We've been, you know, lucky and constantly surprised by how far uh, the books have traveled and so it's it's really great i think for the volunteers as well to see how their work really impacts the world in that way yeah and i, I think the other thing to add is that um uh, as the founders we have also always been volunteers in the mm -hmm. organization um and 
and that in our day jobs, uh, we all work in the tech space to some degree. Um, and it's just really interesting to note that the that book dash is, it has been essentially um, a, 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 an initiative that has been about physical books. Um, and when we talk about the tech, how that technology is right for the context that we in we're in very often, and um, the low resourced context. Um, so we've always had this vision, and, and we'll probably talk about it a little bit later um, about having books in the hands of children. Um, mm -hmm. We see the books in those children's hands, that those children uh, own the books, and that they have those books in their home, like you can see the backdrop there of, that's just the adult's bookcase in our house. <laughs> Aiden has a similar sized bookcase of children's books in his room, um, and, that, and that more children can um, have books in their homes uh, as well, has always been part of it. So even though we've got this amazing, amazing reach uh, digitally, and which is particularly relevant uh, in the context that we're in now with, with the COVID crisis, um, we've also always seen um, uh, that vision of the, of the books in children's hands and homes. Yeah, so Mish, I really, about, oh, sorry, 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 I really <laughs> like that idea of um, of books as technology as well, because I think people so yeah. often forget that the printed book was a technological revolution on its own and is a massive, you know, uh, part of um, our kind of world's technology. So we see digital as technology, but it's not always true. Um, so yeah. it is about finding the right technology for the right context. And that's what we that what we've strived to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and 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 you know, Aiden's here as a as a co-founder because he was about a year old when all this began, and Michelle and I could see he was our first child, uh, and we could see the extraordinary impact that the books we were reading to him were having on his uh, his kind of just development and our time we had to bond with him, uh, and in the early days of Book Dash, we carved out a a vision statement for what this organization could be and the sentence we came to was that every child should own a hundred books by the age of five and some of us like those in our in our home here um, are, are very lucky that we've been able to collect that many of books and th that many books and it's just not remotely possible for most people in the world to buy that many books uh, for their children before the age of five and so the only way we're going to uh, make that vaguely possible is if we give those books away for free. So absolutely fundamentally, Book Dash believes in giving physical, uh, wherever possible, books directly into the hands of children for those children to own. Uh, mm. And right at the front of every Book Dash book, we have a space for the child's name to go so that they can write their name in and really own that book. Because um, when we when we say every child should own 100 books, we really mean own. And then that, that number 100, um, well, maybe we should at this point cast our minds back and think, <laughs> where do we even come up with these things? <laughs> um, here we go. So let's say a little origin story. I'm, you know, I've told the origin story a few times, but maybe Michelle or Taryn, Michelle, maybe you could talk about a, a, a drive to Betty's Bay once <laughs> you were thrashing out some ideas. That, that's so always my, yeah, that's always my, my first memory of the book dash idea was um, was thrashing, uh, trying to come up with the name, which now seems so natural and fits in so perfectly, like naming a child. Um, but at the time, wasn't 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 yet quite right. Um, and we were on a drive to Arthur's parents uh, in Betty's Bay, uh, one of on one of the most scenic roads in uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. I think it even has a, an award, um, Clarence Drive, um, and we were talking um, about book sprints um, and I know that uh, Julia had a session uh, with the book sprints people I think uh, uh, last week um, and talking about the similarities of the approach and, and, and Arthur was a uh, Shuttleworth fellow um, or had been a Shuttleworth fellow at the time and was had just started had been immersed in this world of open and found out about book sprints um, and to be honest, uh, I was like, oh, I don't know if we want, you know, it seems like a really cool idea, but do we want to spend three days or a week or, you know, uh, creating academic books? I think we've got such a broad need here. And actually, I kind of just want to do it as, can we do it as short as possible, you know? Um, 
and and we thought, well, what could we create? What kind of book could we create in a day? Um, and uh, you know, which, which, so was one angle of coming at it, and and we started to think, well, we could do shorter books, we could do children's books, and then that really resonated with us um, because I was in at the at that time Arthur had been in an education publishing background, I'd been in more of a, a commercial trade publishing background, and we knew um, that uh, children's books were not getting published in South Africa at the rate that they were needed or even at the rate that they were being produced, which would be true everywhere, but that there was a real, real gap that I knew that commercial publishers did not want to publish children's books. I'm going to be quite quite blunt. They were really struggling because they said there was no, no market. So we, we got this idea that, okay, it's going to be really, really short. It's not even going to be a book sprint. It's going to be even shorter than that. It's a bit like a hackathon. Is it a book hack? And at some point on Long Clarence Drive, we said, it's a book dash, dash, dash is a quick word, it's a book dash. And, and it just kind of like, I can literally see the sunshine glinting off the sea with <laughs> and, and this sort of like rays of light sort of uh, filtering down as the aha moment came that, you know, we could very quickly make books that weren't being made in a day and we knew and we knew we knew we knew amazing creative people in the publishing space we knew authors we knew illustrators and um and so we decided to give it a try we called it a book dash we actually um then went home to make a logo and used some blocks taryn we used blocks that you had given us when Ada yeah. was like yeah. born or for his first birthday or something these are uh, abc blocks and we made the word book dash and then we Drew, you know, kind of took a photo and turned it into the logo. So it's we've, yeah. we've used. I don't know if that's an open font type on those blocks, but anyway, that's <laughs> that's what I think we it did. Is, and actually. we and we did our and we did our proto and we did our prototype. And I think Arthur can talk yeah. more about that because that happened uh, in in your offices because Taryn and Arthur were working together at that time. Um, but yeah, that's those are my memories. Is 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 this golden light, this beautiful drive, <laughs> and just brainstorming and just. And, and such a beautiful aha moment that we have. Thanks, Mish. It's probably worth jumping in here quickly to explain the connection between the three of us. Um, <laughs> Arthur and Michelle are obviously married to each other and Aidan is their progeny. Uh, I am actually married to Arthur's uh, brother and uh, we live in Amsterdam, but uh, Arthur and I used to work together at a on a project called uh, Paperite, which was uh, sponsored or um, funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation, which um, Arthur was a fellow of at the time. And one of the things that we were seeing while we were working uh, at Paperite, which was geared towards finding innovative ways to solve uh, access, access to books, the crisis around access to books in communities where there weren't any traditional means of access, like bookstores, um, libraries, things that made it difficult to kind of um, lower the barrier to entry to getting into reading. And we you know worked on a couple of uh, innovative solutions around around that but one of the things that we found really frustrating is that we saw that people when they were uh, coming to get books they were coming to get books that they needed not books to read for pleasure and that was one of the critical issues that we always spoke about in the office and um you know over tea coffee over dinners and um, family dinners as well was how do we get people to read more for pleasure. How do we get them to to read because they want to to love books? And I remember one of the phrases that um, that Arthur used. I, Arthur's big into bonsai, and he once used the phrase that we have to grow them like you grow a bonsai. You have to grow them from really little into a you know into a reader. That's how you grow. That's how you grow a reader. And I think also the ideas of hackathons because we're all kind of in the tech space, you know. In the office, we're always thinking about, you know, how do we do a hackathon? How do, you know, how do we make that work for our space, for what we're um, doing? And obviously, I don't know which of these conversations, I think they're all happening at the same time. So it's hard to say what came first. It's all this kind of huge ideation. You know, Arthur and Michelle are driving to Betty's Bay to visit uh, Arthur's folks. And my husband and I are there as well. And so then it's it's constantly happening, constantly part of our kind of um, consciousness, trying to figure out this problem and think about how we can make it um work uh and i love processes so uh, anything to do with you know like figuring out how we're going to fit this together how we're going to unpack it um is just um like light bulbs and and sparkles so yeah yeah it was I, really fun i love the fact that 
for, for me that Bookdash came out of a, a project paper out that Terence talking about that wasn't working at by at the end, right? It was it was a really exciting award winning model that couldn't quite work, and uh, one of the reasons, uh, well, there were there were many reasons it wasn't really gelling, um, and we wanted to just do something to create the kind of market that we needed to exist in order to build a new publishing uh, project or create a new innovation. So we, one of the reasons paper art was so hard to get going was because the market for books was so small. And it was, it was um, 2014, which is 20 years since uh, South Africa became a democracy. So it was a big year for celebration in South Africa. At that year as well, Cape Town was the design capital of the world. Uh, there's a sort of brand that gets given to a city every year to be design capital of the world. So we were feeling very designy, but we were feeling and we were feeling celebratory. And yet at the same time, Taryn and I were working on this project that was failing. And we were sad about that and frustrated. And um, and one of the things that really uh, really came home to me was that when I started in publishing. 15 years earlier in the late 1990s uh, publishers had an opportunity then to embrace this new South Africa and to be much more bold and innovative and uh, deliberate about increasing access to books and we didn't do it I was there right I was one of the people we kept doing things the way we had always done them we kept the same business models the same way of making books we kept making the same kinds of books and here 20 years later in 2014 we still had no bigger a book market than we had had 20 years ago 15 for me because that's when i got into publishing but and and it also made me realize that if we want that market it's going to take 20 years to build we can't now suddenly magic it out of nothing uh you know we should have started 20 years ago and so book dash to me is in many ways a 20-year project we are putting books in the hands of children now because when they're 20 years old and have their own money to spend, we want them buying books. So there's a lot of these different kind of facets that came together to make Book Dash just make a lot of sense. Mm. So we've got um, some questions that I'm very grateful some people have, have sent in to help us uh, figure out what to talk about uh, and what's interesting. And um, we've sort of already of started. <laughs> We've, we've got stuck Amen. right in there, which is great. So, um, yeah, the, the first question was how, who are the people behind the idea? So I'm glad Terence uh, explained some of the uh, the connections, um, which are all an interesting story in themselves. Uh, but let's go back to that vision statement. So one of the questions is talk us through why the vision statement is every child should own 100 books by the age of five. Um, and how has this vision impacted on the journey of the organization? Um, I think that, uh, yeah, we could talk about where that original vision statement came from. Um, and I'm also keen to, to talk about how it's impacted vision because it really has mm. had a big impact on, on strategy, on the decisions we've made over the years. Um, and in that startup paper right that Taryn and I were working in, and of course, Taryn and I were working there, but of course, Michelle being married to me was effectively working in there because you can't be married to, <laughs> to an entrepreneur and not actually be, very much part of the, the enterprise. Um, there we had had a, uh, a bold vision statement. And the vision statement there was every book within walking distance of every home. And that particular statement had been incredibly useful to us in deciding what to focus on. Every decision we made, we could say, does this decision get us closer to putting every book within walking distance of every home? Um, and so when we started Book Dash, we knew that had been really, really powerful. And I can't really remember the details of how we put that vision statement together. Michelle and Taryn, do you have any memory of where exactly the phrase coalesced? Yeah, I mean, I remember talking about um, a lot about what our our vision would be because we obviously we we wanted to have that strong vision to to guide us, and we wanted it to be ambitious but also achievable and useful. And I think for a, a long time we didn't realize how achievable a hundred books was um it still seemed like a big um a big number but I, I remember doing a lot of reading around um around how many books kids need on average you know how many books help them um and i mean i 
I can't remember any of the articles or where they came from, but I, I just remember uh, it being a kind of resonant number that, and I think it might've even been slightly less than that, that there were, it was like 80 books is a good, uh, you know, a good number of books for a kid in order to ensure the right literacy levels as they're entering uh, school and learning to read. And, um, and it had a lot to do with variation as well. So having, you know, I mean, obviously at the time you were reading the same book over and over and again to uh, to Aiden. And, and so we were, you know, thinking about yeah, how many different books do you need so the parents don't go crazy as well. Um, and so that you also have something that resonates with a number of different people because someone might, um, you know, we wanted to tell a lot of different uh, different stories and for kids to have um, a window into the worldview of, of many different characters. I remember that was part of it. But I, I also just remember, you know, as sitting down and just writing down, you know, I'll say hundreds, but, you know, tens <laughs> of, you know, different phrases that we could use. And that was the one that kind of stuck with us as a, as a you know, resonant phrase. I just, that's, yeah my memory of the um of the statement mesh i don't know what yours no is. the same thing I, and, and i do know that what we wanted was that that is a bit of attention because a lot of mm. and when i say attention i mean a tension um in that a lot of people see that number and there's a there's there's a it's not an a, it's it's an exciting number but they want to fight it in a way um they kind of they, they feel like it's a little bit impossible. And, and I think I know from, uh, you know, working with these two other people <laughs> on various parts of our lives that um, just pushing the boat out a little bit further than is quite comfortable, but not so far that it's that it can't be achieved is, is kind of a, a, a modus operandi. Um, and so I think we wanted to do the same here. We wanted people to do a little bit of a double take, but we also wanted to be sure that we were going to get it done. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, and I think we felt that we could do it, and that we felt that um, it would just get that message across. We were we were really um, riled up at the time um, about the fact that you know when you build when we were building, I say we were building paper art. I'm going to say it that way, but when we were building that, the, the 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 frustration that we had around the fact that. Um, the market wasn't there apparently and and the pushback was that the market would not be there and the and the you know it it it, it just was never the market was only ever going to be this big and was only ever going to happen in this way and uh we were riled up by that um mm -hmm. and particularly riled up by it, uh, from the point of view of children who then weren't given even the opportunity to have a say in that because they couldn't afford or choose to, to have books so so it was a bit of a rallying cry and it was yeah it was a little bit of a wake up but also we knew i think we intended to do it we weren't quite sure how but we intended to do it so it was a rallying cry for myself as well absolutely and it was about uh that pu pushing it out the, the pushing the and to a number that many people find uh surprising because it seems so high um, and then working very hard to get people used to the idea that it's actually not a high number. Mm. Um, it's totally doable. I think we once did a sum about what proportion of the national education budget it would take to give every child in South Africa 100 books by the age of five. And it was tiny. It was like 2% of the education budget or something, which I know is a, is a large amount of money. Um, but when you're seen in those terms, you kind of think, oh, well, then we should just totally do that, right? Especially if you're printing in huge quantities, you can get really low costs. And the other thing is that we wanted to help people think in bigger numbers when they think about books, think in abundant numbers, because we're all trained because of the cost of books to think of books as so precious that just a few is, is a lot. And that's an, it's an artificial number. You know, there's a term in psychology called an anchor. It's, we've, we've all anchored the cost of books and the number of books a, a, a person might own at a very low number um, for some mythical non-existent reason, right? So sometimes we've we've enjoyed asking organizations how many books they can give away to children. If we give them books, how many books can, are they able to give away? Um, and if they say, you know, oh, I don't know, 20, 50, we say, no, no, how many thousands can you give away? Because we want 
organizations and our partners and um, you know, everyone to think in just much bigger numbers when it comes to yeah. it becomes possible when you're uh, when you've had these brilliant volunteers create books that now cost only the cost of the printing to give to people. There's no royalties or, or very little admin and so on, which is quite exciting. Um, and then of course yeah. we focused on the by the age of five on the ECD space, the early childhood development years. Um, we really cared about those first thousand days of a child's life, uh, which is often starts when uh, the child is still in the womb as well. Um, and so we know that a lot of education systems focus a lot on children from once they get to school, but actually so much brain development is done and dusted by age of five that actually we need to get those books in much earlier. So I think that was just a natural um, piece of the puzzle. And then how it's actually affected our strategy going forward over the years, that's been interesting too. Every year, usually around the beginning of the year, the whole team, the management team and the board um, get together uh, and incidentally, in addition to the three of us, our other board member is Corinne Bezadenote, who's also the Chief Operating Officer at the Shuttleworth Foundation, um, and has an amazing uh, sense for organizational dynamics and, um, and is an integral part of our decision making. We all get together and we try to figure out what our strategy is for the next, for the coming years. And that's been a big part of, and that vision statement has been a big part of the decisions we've had to make. Um, uh, Taryn and Michelle, I think particularly it has affected our decisions around focusing on events and printing and translation and mm. digital and so on. Can you think of particular times when we've made decisions based on the vision statement? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the first main thing that I would like to say about that is that um, because we and this was a huge benefit of doing all of that thinking and work around it up front, was that because we had set out that really strong vision statement, we were able to use it from the very beginning in our kind of strategic planning for the organization. And while it's, you know, we've shifted and changed and adapted in a lot of different um, situations, actually our overarching strategy hasn't changed very much at all year to year because we're guided by that um, principle. It's like a guiding light at the end of a tunnel you know to get us there and so it's been really um useful and important and valuable in in establishing our strategy right from the get-go a really solid strategy that we've been able to that's been able to pull us through um a lot mm. I, I think i want to get onto the questions that was is being raised about our first event but i do think that it ties into this ties into that and that the point that i want to make was that there was a point that we got to our events are kind of what we're sort of famous for or they were initially because they were so much fun everybody wanted to be involved people were sort of flabbergasted by how we managed to get 10 children's books in one day uh, sort of uh, volunteer voluntarily given um and and so the the book dash events themselves are called a, they're called a book dash um and that was really central and we were we were loving running those and it was so exciting um but when we got to the point where we had created a hundred books through Book Dash events, um, we could then start to really think about scale. And I'd like to get to us to talk a bit about scale and how we design for scale, because I think mm -hmm. Open came into that very much. And also the idea of, I sometimes say there's a whole lot of unsexy stuff happening in the back end that's also very tech oriented about how we um, built our systems for scale. Um, and we can maybe talk about that later. But the fact is that we knew that when we got to hundred books, we had a hundred books. And, and it kind of took us, we could step back from the book dash events a little bit and go, now let's take these hundred books and see how big we can make that. And then we made a decision, a strategic decision to distribute a million copies by the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and which we're on track for. Uh, we've had a little bit of a wobble as everybody has in <laughs> the recent events, but still on track for. Um, and even when we set that target a couple of years ago, we didn't tell anybody, you might, some of you might be hearing this for the first time, <laughs> but we didn't tell anybody at the time, we're like, let's see, can we go there? A million books seems like quite a lot. Um, and, um, and then we set that target. We realized that we'd made a lot of titles um, and now we really need to focus on building out the partnerships um, and the systems for, for distribution. Um, I'm sure Arthur might, to get a chance later to talk about collaborative print runs as well, um, which is one of our unsexy but incredibly effective methodologies that we use for scale. But 
I think that was it. it was like a hundred books seemed like a lot and then all of a sudden it wasn't and we had to give ourselves another little target that we look like we're going to meet again and um, I'm sure you'll be hearing more from us in future but that's how it's guided it can we get, can we now get a hundred books because probably the most that most children get we're looking at maybe 10 12 15 to particular organizations can we now actually get children a hundred books um, and and so that means millions and millions of copies. Yeah. So so let's go back to the book naturalist question. Mm. Yeah. Um, story. Um, Taryn, we were kitting out at then the paper art office. That was the site of the very first yes. experimental book dash. Uh, yeah. Um yeah, I mean, so at the very beginning, we were kind of um playing with this idea and thinking about how we would make it work. And um I remember, you know, at first we you know, we're, we're, we're always thinking really big. And so at first we were thinking really big and then we decided to kind of pull ourselves back a lot and to say, okay, well, let's just have it here at the office and we could probably house and, we're, you know, just spitballing three teams. So let's see how three teams work in the space, two teams, sorry, two teams work in the space and we'll provide all of the food and, you know, we got kind of like pizza and cake and stuff. And, um, and then we just invited friends that we had. We had um, editor friends and writers, illustrators, um, and they all came together. And the first book dash, we um, just did it for six hours. So we thought that, um, you know, six hours is a good amount of time. People are working for, you know, just, a, you know, just a, it's a full, a full day basically. And then we would have some time at the end to kind of review the stories and, um, at that first event, we we kind of learnt our first um, first big lessons, and I think every event since then we've learnt lessons and we've we've implemented um, those lessons. We've pulled them into the to the planning and the structure of a book dash, and then expanded our approach uh, out to make it better and better um, each time. But I just remember not really knowing what to expect from that first book dash, but being very excited about. It happening and we said you know we did a lot of thinking about the process beforehand we designed flat plans and we designed you know structures that people would work in um and those all worked really well so all of that planning and that thought and i think you know with michelle and Arthur having come from previous publishing backgrounds as well they were bringing all of that knowledge into the process um as well and so it worked really well in a lot of ways uh, but they didn't finish the books in uh, in six hours. So that was the first uh, big lesson, uh, but they got halfway. And so that's kind of how we then established the 12 hour uh, model for creating books in 12 hours, which I mean, at the, at the time, 12 hours seemed like a big uh, commitment. And we were worried the second book dash that we would be asking too much, but we plowed ahead um, and actually found that people were so willing to give of their time, so generous with their talents, um, and that they actually also enjoyed the process and got so much out of it personally as well. Um, I think creatives usually work in these silos where you're illustrating by yourself, you're writing by yourself, you're you know setting up the book way after all of the thinking and ideation around it has happened. And so to suddenly be in this room where there's this magic of collaboration was something really special and spectacular for a lot of our creatives and. Over the years as well, we found that um, because we always try to uh, to pick uh, illustrators, creators, writers who uh, come from all levels of um, experience. So we want to make sure that they have the talent to complete the book, but uh, also that they'll be bringing um, different ideas and different approaches uh, into play as well and so sometimes we give really young illustrators a chance but then we also have really experienced established well known illustrators and we've seen the other kind of magic where those younger illustrators are in the room as their heroes for some you know sometimes for the first time and able to establish those networks and connections which are also really magical um i veered off topic yeah i have to talk about something like yeah, yeah. <laughs> i want to yeah. talk about I want to talk about something that also happens after those first book dash. After that first book dash, we we did finish the books because one of our other uh, mottos is no book left behind. Yes. No book, every book gets finished mm. um, that was ever started. Um, and when we finished those, we we um, we self funded a print run, and we went to a local children's uh, like a, an ECD center. And in those days, 
we handed out the books ourselves. I, and this is what's still one of my enduring memories as well, is these boxes of books and going into an ECD center. And my favorite thing is, and I don't have a book dash book on my desk. Maybe Aiden can go fetch us one. <laughs> what I love about it, and, and Arthur brought it up earlier, was this idea of ownership. And we sat and we had pens and we sat with every single child and wrote their names um, in the front of their books with them, either for them if they couldn't yet write or, uh, you know, with them if they could. And we sat and we had these rows of kids and they each got three books and they had, wrote their names in their books. We still get asked today, you know, when I say, okay, I, I've been like at uh, New Crossroads Library or something, I take cookies with them, give everybody their own pen, give them the book and say, you can write your name in it now and minds are blown. Um, yeah. yeah, and I still remember that, and I love that about it. And and uh, we kind of miss that because in the scale we can't do that anymore. But every once in a while we treat ourselves to a little book handout and and letting children write their own names <laughs> in their book um, in the front. Yeah, thank you, Aiden. Thank you. He is such he is so helpful. And let them write their names in the front there. Um, and that. Yeah, I mean, that is just also part of the magic. So I think people think of the book dashes, but that was, for me, if we're talking about memories, a huge memory is going to the Jira Center um, and handing those children their own books and writing their names in there. And that's when I realized, um, I think I just closed the loop on the magic. Uh, mm. that point, so. thanks, for, thanks for bringing up that uh, first book giveaway. Uh, one of the things that I remember so clearly, and I'm not sure if it actually happened to me or if it happened to you, Michelle, was <laughs> one little girl who um, got her book, the first book that her name was written in, and started walking away. And whoever was writing the names in the book said, no, 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 come, come back, there's two more. And her face, just the astounded look at the idea that she was going to get three books to take home that were <laughs> hers forever, was just, I mean, I get, I've got goosebumps. I can see you tearing up. You're tearing I up. Know. You're actually crying a little bit. <laughs> that was amazing. My, uh, my, my tear ducts are very close to my heart. So. <laughs> you know, that, that day we gave away 750 books. Mm. And it seemed and huge. A couple, a couple of months yeah. later, we decided we wanted to go really big. <laughs> we were going to raise money to print 15,000 books. We, it was an unimaginable goal. Uh, we set up a crowdfunding campaign uh, on the South African crowdfunding um, platform Thunderfund. Uh, Taryn pretty much ran that single-handedly. It was all, almost full time for two months just running that campaign. Um, and I think we might have made it. I don't know if we actually raised the no, we 15,000. We, we did. did. Yeah, we did. Uh, yeah, we did. Yeah. YouTube video yeah. is still up. And every time I watch it, it's a great little video. So, and it says like, wow, we're going for 15,000. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> Um, and then I think of the, the, the team meeting, the strategy meeting, where we decided we wanted to go for a million books by 2020. And we had, and the same feeling of, of that just being an overwhelmingly humongous goal. Um, of course, at that time, we had our first full-time staff member, uh, Julia Norris, who's somewhere on the call here with us. Um, and of course, we were being a little unfair because the 15,000 was a target we set for ourselves as founders. <laughs> the million target was for her to, to, to figure out. Um, and later on, then um, Dorette and Zayb have joined the team as well, um, which has is, which is, um, grown things a bit. So anyway, um, so let's get some other questions that are on the, on the list here as well. We've actually um, gotten one from Andy in the chat, Arthur. Yes, Would you I like to show yeah. I'm yeah. going to get there. Yeah, totally. Definitely want to okay, get cool. there. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, so I wanted to check that there are a couple of here that are kind of segues to, to fundamentals. But actually, let's let's jump over there because because Andy's question does speak to some of the other issues that have come up in other questions. So Andy wrote, um, I appreciate that the audience for book dash books is very often not the same as the market for publishers of children's books. But could you talk about how a non-royalty, non-profit publisher operates alongside commercial publishing? Is it a harmonious relationship? Uh, are they complementary? Uh, and it's a great question, one we've thought a lot about uh, and so on. Um, I'll give a little nutshell of how I see it, um, and then I'm keen to hear Michelle and Taryn's take on it as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, BookDash was founded for a whole lot of reasons, but one of them was to start creating the market that we would be able to publish into in 20 years' time as publishers. 
because I'm still a publisher in my day job, right? So I still make books for people. Um, I want a market to be there as well. Um, and the only way we could create that market is by giving people enough books that books became an everyday part of their lives. Um, and uh, and then the other thing is that uh, because our books are open license, any publisher is welcome to take our books and sell them as well. Hey, um, yeah, I've kind of always been a bit surprised that that no big publishing company we know of has gone and taken our files and and sold, sold the books through their existing channels. It's totally fine to do that, which just seems insane to some people, but we're totally happy with it. I, I was once challenged in a public uh, forum uh, about how we were we were devaluing books, um, and I I, um, I was extremely fierce in my reply uh, to say oh. it is a it's a, it, it it is shockingly cruel to think that um, giving away free books uh, is somehow bad for society when when the world needs so many books. Um, books are an incredibly magical thing. They're one of the few products in the world where it's impossible to meet the demand. The more books you put in the world, the more books people want. And uh, and that means that we think it's a harmonious relationship. I've been very pleasantly surprised by how little negative feedback we've got from publishers. But anyway, let me see what, uh, what uh, yeah, Michelle, what are you what are you thinking? And turn off that. Yeah, like Arthur, um, surprised that I, I think open is such a, a an unusual, con until you're living it, until you're actually living it and you're seeing what impact um, having an open license has, um, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to get your head around the fact that um, you don't, you, you're, you're allowed to um, distribute these books um, and, and that you're paying of the part in a system. So I came from a trade publishing background where, you know, a huge part was, you know, was, was talking about royalties and, and, and dealing with the licensing. I mean, one of the things we wanted to remove was this idea that we couldn't move books across borders without two people sitting at a little tiny desk at the London Book Fair and queuing up to talk to each other and then starting a conversation, which then was like, you know, six months of emails later and, uh, you know, some impenetrable contract and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, and so, so I think I'm still surprised that they haven't, I, I think, the, the mindset is still, still so much around competition that um, that you effectively have <clears throat> removed your own competition by saying, well, there, there will be no competition because this publisher could publish it and that publisher can publish it. And we'd love to see that because our intent is to is to flood the world with, with children's books. Um, but um, but it is, it, it, uh, I think what it does most of all is it shows up the, the mindset um, and and it's one of the reasons why, yes, the local publishing industry has struggled to grow its market. Um, and we could print 100 million more books and people would want them. Um, and that's the difference, I think. Yeah, I mean, um, just to kind of jump in there, I think that that was one of the crucial things that our, um, our kind of vision statement of 100 books, uh, you know, in the hands of every child uh, that it's led to, because if you're going to have a locked down license on your books, are you going to get 100 books into the hands of every kid? Well, no, you aren't. And if you try and jealously guard your content and um, and if you're opposed to other people using and sharing it, are you going to get 100 books in the hands of every kid? No, you're not. So for us, you know, that vision statement, that idea that, well, what, what are we actually trying to do here? We're trying to get 100 books in the hands of every single child. What is the way that we're going to do that? Open is the only it's the only answer to have, um, you know, that sort of a, a model to, to to compound upon that in that way. Um, and I think that the surprising thing for us as well has been that just because you're, you're, and I think this is something that people assume a lot when they look at an open model and they think that, well, it's worth nothing because you've made it open. And I think that mm -hmm. they really underestimate the efficiencies and the process, and Michelle wanted to talk about scale, maybe we can segue into it, but the scale that certain things are able to uh, to create. And just because our content is free, we don't see, you know, publishers or printers just taking our books, printing them and distributing. People come to us first and they're very happy to pay the uh, management fee that we charge on us arranging a print run because they also trust our expertise at creating those books and, and I mean, creating them in the sense of creating them from scratch, but then also creating them in terms of um, initiating the print run and managing the print run and our kind of quality control on that. And so I think that there's 
systems in place that are you know part of our expertise that people value and still come to the organization see the organization as an expert and want to support it because it's open not because it's you know it's closed they feel like well we want to contribute to this thing because what you're doing is bigger than you know just that little thing you're not trying to jealously we've never jealously guarded anything and as a result we've seen everyone from partners to um you know printers and suppliers to our mm -hmm. volunteers have come with you know so much more than we could ever have imagined because they want to match our own kind of generous spirit and openness with their own yeah, yeah. but that said we have we have sold books um, yeah we have people absolutely. have paid money for what this is this is one of the ones that has been particularly popular as a paid for title um, and we don't get because the market hasn't yet been saturated um, this idea that publishers always have of this cannibalization is going to happen um, hasn't. And people who are willing to pay for a book will still pay for it. Um, and they understand that um, people who can't yet pay for a book, but children who, who need them will also be getting books. And it's and it all parts, it all, it all uh, ties together. But I mean, the level of, of production that we have on our books is a level that people are willing to pay money for. We've done campaigns through Woolworths at Christmas, bargain books. Um, uh, these are sold in 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 bookstores. I, I went back, I snuck into the book lounge. They had opened up a, a very well-known bookstore in Cape Town, and they have a stand full of book dash books there. Um, and this is also, you know, obviously helps to to fund our operations and and keep us giving away so many books. Um, and and you know the numbers are quite different. But people um, are, are paying for these books as well, and it sits alongside. Um, and in fact, if, if anything, we've seen more publishers bringing in cheaper books and trying to match the price points, because these are at like 20, 30 Rand. And I've noticed quite a few more of those types of things coming into South Africa now. So maybe we are growing them. Maybe, I don't want to claim yeah, anything, yeah. but maybe we are, you know, we are working together. Um, and maybe it is actually happening. So Tomorrow, uh, there is another session in the Open Publishing Fest, uh, 12 o'clock South African time, uh, and on the power of open. Uh, and uh, Julia Norris and Dorit Lowe uh, of our team will be there to talk about what happens when you share freely, what, where do your books travel, and, and what kind of scale can, mm. can you achieve. And that's been our, um, our uh, experience, and it's just been so much fun. We get like messages from all over the world from people saying hey just translated your book into nepalese or J japanese or um, urdu or uh, yeah uh, i think our favorite was uh was it canada i can't remember anyway some know. languages that we had, hadn't know, known of before so that's been fun learning about new parts of the world and new languages so, so that's been really great i think that i want to uh, also answer uh, or talk about a question um that came in from elimu the um uh digital publishing uh, uh, team, if I'm right there, Karen, you might know, based in Kenya. Yeah, Kenya, um, yeah, Kenya. And asking about digital, um, whether we produce EPUB format, eBooks, and what our thinking around digital is. And that's evolved quite a bit. Um, and I know that uh, Taryn, who works in a digital publishing uh, <laughs> venture um, and distributor, knows that industry really, really well, um, and that yeah, Michelle's been brought a lot of strategic thinking to our, our digital work over the last few years. As I said earlier, we focused a lot on print at the beginning. Mm. Um, the last few months, well, now all of a sudden, you know, web traffic <laughs> has spiked massively for obvious reasons, and we have to think more about digital. So far, there have been other amazing partner organizations that have done incredible things with digital just by using the files that we provide. Mm. Um, and we've got a lot of, uh, there's still a lot more we could do, but anyway. Uh, Taryn, Michelle, what's your thinking on the digital future for Bookdash? Yeah, I mean, um, we can talk about the digital future, but there's also, obviously, I think this question was also about our early thinking around digital, um, which you, yeah, you, you've kind of uh, touched on as well. I think because, you know, Michelle and I were working in, and Arthur also in his, you know, previous lives has worked in the digital publishing space as well. Um, there's a big focus for us. And so because we had that, it was always a, an important aspect. And we knew that and we, you know, we passionate, we're passionate about digital, but weren't going to disregard the importance of the print for solving the actual problem that we needed to solve at the time that we needed to solve it. And so 
while we always had a digital strategy, it was always, um, it came second best uh, consciously. It was a conscious strategic decision for that to happen. Um, because, you know, between the three of us, we've always had the ex expertise to go into that area if we, if we wanted to build upon it. And, um, you know, we had the good fortune of, um, of a very uh, well-known popular Google um, affiliated developer um, seeing and learning about our project and because the books were open and again you know this is part of the power of open but because the books were open and she was looking for a new exciting project to work on she was able to um, build an application for us a reader application for um, Android so we only have it on Android at the moment but these things were possible and and we could ingest them and work with her on them because of the way in which we built those structures that Michelle was talking about earlier behind the scenes that enable us to um to work openly with people um in a lot of different avenues and again to partner with people like um you know world reader uh, rivets from um, from Google, uh, Snapify, where I work, uh, and other organizations across the continent, um, African Storybook Project, Storyberries, who all ingest our digital versions. They're not EPUB versions, but they're they're PDF versions. Um, and yeah, those those things are possible because of the open license. Yeah, I think our digital strategy was a very unsexy digital strategy, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, one that works. From the beginning, we always made those files those um, print ready and those open files available and downloadable. So we often only hear that somebody has created something with our works when uh, either they let us know or somebody does a Google. I mean, the other day, somebody does a Google. The other day we found a Nigerian gospel singer had used one of our songs um, in a YouTube video, uh, uh, had used one of our books in a YouTube video for a song and uh, like had the illustrations and had turned the words into a gospel song. Um, it's a beautiful, Which is amazing. Book, the, lioness, the, li the one with the lioness, um, and um, we don't. But we, but because we, so it's digital has enabled our scale from the point of view that it's been available. You can download it, you can play with it, and you can. So, so in that sense, that has always been there. Um, I think in the next steps are really thinking about how do we refine what we're offering there so that people can even more easily share because we're very much around not not holding on to uh, you know all the methods of distribution we understand that that's going to limit our scale so really it is around uh, refining what we do what kind of file formats do we need how do we need to do, um, make them available um, and 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 just really getting that really really sharp um, helping parents we've had a lot of you know whether it becomes easier for parents then to download and, and use those um, you know, for teachers to download and use, we'll be thinking more about those file formats. And so not, no, not having a digital empire that we run and, and control the channels of, but um, smoothing and, and, uh, and, and opening channels for others to use up. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, if, if anyone here or uh, is in that space uh, that you're working with digital files, one of the things we're thinking about right now is how do we empower other organizations to more easily reuse our content in digital formats? Please mm. let us know. We really need to know uh, how, what would make it really easy for you to reuse our material digitally in terms of how we set up our files and so on. Um, because those are, that's what we want to do. We want to, we're in a position where we get to help other people do their work better by providing mm. content that's really high quality and really easy to use. Yeah. We're pretty close to, to running out of time. Uh, this time has flown for us. Um, <laughs> and the last uh, question here that we wanted to get to was, what has been your favorite lesson from the whole experience of founding Book Dash? Uh, I think that that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think I've got a, an idea of mine. Um, so I'll, I'll explain that while I buy Michelle and Terrence some time to think about their favorite <laughs> lesson. Um, you know, when Bookdash started, uh, I and my entrepreneurial ventures had um, had had a lot of projects that hadn't worked because when you're experimenting, 99% of what you try fails, uh, and that's that's you know fascinating. That's that's good data, um, and it, and everything that had worked had worked because we had really pushed it hard and really dragged it along. And what happened with Bookdash is it kind of happened by magic and. For me, the favorite lesson was when you get lucky enough, when the stars align, when the right people join you on your journey uh, from our management team um, 
uh, to the volunteers who come to the events uh, when they join you, then everything snowballs and BookDash has grown on its own in a way that no other venture I've been part of has. Uh, and that's so the, the lesson for me was you can get that lucky and that's amazing. <laughs> so that's um, yeah. Darren, Michelle? Um, I'll go next. Um, I think one of my biggest lessons and and favorite things about BookDash is um, the power of focus. So because we've been very clear from the beginning about what we do and what we don't do, um, and we've said no to things, we, we have, you know, we have actively turned down opportunities where we didn't think that they were serving our purpose and our, and our goal. And we've been laser focused on that goal from the very beginning. And to see the magic that unfolds, for an organization when you have that level of focus when you don't say yes to everything where you knuckle down and you really just try to work on the best ways to solve those problems that you're trying to solve for example we decided very actively that book dash wasn't going to do the handing out of books to kids we were going to work with partners who would who would do that because our strength was in the book creation and then working on the ways to distribute that to our partners not that we would also then have a team on the ground distributing books and and working in that way and you know those integral decisions about what we are and what we do which we constantly have and realign on and reevaluate um i think have been so critical to the success of the organization and have also informed the ways in which i've approached other work outside of um outside of the work that we do at book dash so i think that for me that's been one of the kind of biggest lessons around running an organization is that power of um, of that focus. Um, and yeah, it, it makes BookDash a, a magic space for me as well. Yeah, I think for me, very similar to, to what Arthur and Taryn have said. Um, and I think the big lesson for me is, um, I think we really like to do things well, all three of us in our, in our ways. And sometimes that extends to wanting to be involved in everything or wanting to control every part of a process. And I think we we have honed, I mean, uh, Rujeka was saying here, like, how did you, in the comments, how did you make the event so slick but fun? But I promise you that, that thing is orchestrated to like <laughs> five minute increments. Um, <laughs> and we have like, we, we plan that fun. I'm the fun planner. We are going to have fun. And so, uh, um, but you want to control that, but actually to get that outsized impact, which is something that I do in my day-to-day -day work as well. I work in this sort of impact and venture philanthropy space and, and um, the, you know, into that space and systems and ecosystems. It's all very academic until you're doing it um, and have experienced this, like what we've experienced through BookDash. But um, that, that to get that impact means letting go. Um, mm -hmm. And it means trusting other people. And it means working out where you can be of service in a system. Because, you know, um, as somebody once said to me, we're all part of a, a quilt, you know, we each a piece in a quilt to make this patchwork. Um, and, and we all play our role. Um, and to hold that space and accept that space and to trust um, that you that you can work, that there are people that you will work with and that who will take a vision further um, if you can focus on what you do well. Um, and again, it is one of those lessons that you can apply in multiple places in your life. So it's a, it's an amazing lesson to have. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got one more founder to ask what he has learned from BookDash. He's been thinking about it a little bit. What do you what do you reckon, Aiden? Um, Book Dash also does bring you together in the most powerful way you have ever imagined. Indeed. Wow. That's, That's true. very so true. Very, very true. That is a lovely note to end on. Thank you so much for everybody <laughs> for being here, uh, for joining us. Some of the people in the, the group today um, have been at Book Dash as, as volunteers. Thanks so much for joining us here. You guys are the absolute energetic heart of the organization. And uh, those of you who haven't seen it already, have a look at the chat. They've weighed in as well about their experiences of BookDash. Mm. The BookDash website is bookdash.org. You can find a lot more about us there, read all the books, uh, contact the team. Uh, and then another reminder, tomorrow at 12 South Africa time, uh, the BookDash management team will be talking about the power of open and what's possible. 
<laughs> thank you so much again. And uh, thanks, thank guys. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.